The world is full of ordinary people, ordinary people just like you and me, who have actually done pretty extraordinary things, things that you and I just look back on in awe, but we would walk past them on the street and not think a second that this person has led such an amazing life, all due to one thing, they've just backed themselves and they have become something that they are just great. My name's Kyle Reba and this podcast is about just that, ordinary people who are now showing us that it is possible for ordinary people like you and I to back themselves and become something amazing. So join me in listening to these people, listening to their stories, because who knows, one day I might be talking to you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first episode of the Kyle Reba podcast. My name's Kyle Reba. You would remember me from such podcasts as the COVID conversations, uh, which happened about 12 months ago, 18 months ago, two years ago even. Um, but now we're back and we had a couple of stop starts and I thought it was only a good tradition that the first person on our COVID conversations, was he the highest ranking? He was one of the highest ranking, second highest. Uh, okay. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time. Now, um, our second highest ranking COVID conversation person could be our first guest again on the Kyle Reba podcast. Peter Smedley, welcome. Welcome. Hello, Kyle. And hello to all the viewers, listeners. <laughs> Now, some of you will be able to see this on YouTube, on video. Some of you will be listening on our uh, other platforms. Um, there was a lot of deliberation leading into this podcast on the choice of background. So if you are on uh, YouTube watching this, please make sure you put a comment and um, let Peter know about his about his backdrop if it was not. What's that in the far corner, mate? Is that the um, calendar of what? things to do? Yeah, that's the year calendar up Ooh. there. Doesn't look, well, it's pretty full. Pretty yeah, there's a bit on it. There's a bit on it. It'll get fuller yet too. <laughs> it's only April. Some things that aren't written on it yet. <laughs> so um, for a lot of you guys that are new to this, way we structure these podcasts is we are, uh, Pete got sent a list of questions a few days ago. Um, and on that list of questions, he has 10 questions that he has been given time to deliberate over and answer. Mm -hmm. And... We're going to work through those questions. We will digress every now and then. Um, we will keep it on track as much as we can. But our first question, birth to now, Peter, in seven minutes. I have a timer. I have a timer. We are both so diligent that I have a seven-minute timer set up. What's, so just on this, what's your what's your alarm on your timer? Oh, I think it's just Beacon. Oh. See, mine's, oh, no. Tim, mine's Timmy Trumpet. Oh, hang on, hang on. Let's let's compare. See, already digressing. Here we go. Here's mine. I can't hear it. Do you like that? We can't I can't hear, it. hear that. Oh, I can't oh. hear it. It's all right. It's not worth hearing. Okay, anyway. Uh, we are digressing. Birth to seven minutes, Peter. Your time starts now. Okay. Um, born in a little country town uh, called Tyab, down on the Mornington Peninsula in southern Australia. Um, uh, third child with two older sisters, so the youngest son, mm -hmm. uh, to a couple of fruit growing people. Um, you know, so my mum and dad were fruit growers, apple growers down in Tyab. Uh, growing up in a country town was really, really good. Uh, made my way through, you know, making pocket money and stuff from working on the orchard up through school, enjoying a, um, a good school time right the way through till the end of year 11. Uh, discovering quite a bit about myself as we all do through that period. Mm. Ended up working for the family business and um, holy cow. Working for the family business until I took over the marketing side of things and um, ended up working in the Footscray market. Um, uh, we would go in there two, three times a week. Geez, the clock has a real influence on how fast I speak, Kyle. Yeah, mate, you only got six minutes to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, going into the market and selling uh, 
the family crop of apples throughout a, a whole year, we would go in twice a week and and have orders for fruit shop owners and so forth. And we'd have to pack them back at the orchard, take them into the market. I ended up looking after that through my dad having a nasty injury, but then I just kept doing it because I had a bit of a flair for it. And I found home base in the market as well, because I'd been going in there through my school years as well. Um, in time, we opened up a fruit shop, it started out as a roadside store. We opened up a fruit shop and uh, that flourished. We took on wholesale orders. So in the end, I ended up going into the market three times a week, selling apples and buying produce and bringing that home as well for the fruit shop. So I was selling that, supplying, buying, selling the whole time. So I ended up being that guy in the market doing that, looking after all the production of apples. Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, outdoors is all the fruit, all the fruit trees and stuff that my dad and eventually my brother-in-law looked after for quite a while. Um then eventually my parents separated and um that sort of spelled the end of the family business over a, a few years it eventually um finished up and they sold up i went traveling for three years by myself i got in my panel van and, and circumnavigated australia and stopping in at different um towns and cities and living and working there for a while making some money saving some money and then traveling on finding you know and catching up with all sorts of friends and making new ones at the same time uh, after three years was done, I came back home to Victoria. And well, yeah, first, I had plans to go and live in in Queensland of all places on the Sunshine Coast. Mm -hmm. I fell in love with that place. But then, when I came home to Victoria, I realised I had all my best family, best friends there, and I love the football as well and the culture in Melbourne. So, I gave up those plans and resettled in Melbourne after three years and went back into the market and started working for a family in there that I was mates with from before. And then a guy came across and said, I've heard about you. I want you to come and sell mushrooms for me. So I became a mushroom wholesaler. And that entailed selling anything from 120 to 150 grand's worth of mushrooms in a week. Wow. So that was a lot. It's like, like huge amounts of mushrooms coming in and out every day. And I ended up being general manager of that business for quite a while. So is it pronounced, so correct pronunciation, shiitake? Shiitake, two eyes. Shiitake. We sold 24 varieties of mushrooms. Jesus Christ. Yeah. And most of them being agaricus, which is your common buttons, cups, and flats. So, you you know, the stuff you find in a fruit shop as well as Swiss brands. But anyway, that's a whole different thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I stayed in doing that for quite a while. Um, in that time, I got married. We had had our first son and we were um, renovating a house in the southeastern suburbs of Melbourne. And then I realized um, I can't become a very good father and i don't want to get caught into this um marketing routine because you would start work at one in the morning and work through it all about mm. 10 in the morning and then sleep a little bit get up and i'll be back on the phone organizing another two truckloads of mushrooms and another three or four hours sleep and off to work again and it wasn't a healthy lifestyle and i knew it wasn't going to be good to be a family man so i um, bought an investment pro property down on the coast on the mornington peninsula and we eventually made the break and moved down there sold up all of our investments and put everything down into this one house on the coast. Um, renovated there for a while and just, I took my hands off work for a while and my wife worked and I renovated and um, extended and developed our, our property. And we've got a really nice house these days that I'm sitting mm -hmm. in right now. Um, after that, or, yeah, once I'd sort of got that going, I started uh, really jumping back into martial arts because I'd started it earlier in my life and through the night shift stuff, it was really hard to do. And then I jumped back into it and and dived into it seriously. I opened up my own um, martial arts school and that started growing. In the meantime, I picked up a three-day-a-week part-time job for one of my old customers. That was well paid, but it was high um, commitment as well. And he was uh, pushing me towards having a senior role in the business as well. But then at the same time, underneath came this karate business that grew and grew and grew. And I said, man, I'm going to bail out of this soon. He was disappointed. I left that and became a full-time martial arts instructor and had a second child. And here we are living in beautiful summers down on the Mornington Peninsula with my martial arts business, which has flourished and turned into a, an amazing thing, which astounds me week after week with a happy family, wife, two boys living on the peninsula is where I am right now, starting way back in Tyab growing apples that was really good you still got a minute to go yeah do you want me to carry on some more about mushrooms i have one well, i have one question <laughs> yeah so your family were those people that you would see selling fruit on the side of the road you know 
at all, you know, like you drive past the highway and see that, you know, those sorts of stuff that you see. Yep. We had a bin trail. We had bin trailers that you would put those big fruit bins on. You put three or two of them on. And we had a three, one that had carried three bins. So you take it into the orchard, you pick the fruit, put it into the bin, then unload the bin and it'd go into storage, cold storage and stuff. And that's so a profitable, that like you would get a lot of people. Would you get like, is, is regulars a thing in that sort of thing? Or like just a lot of selling tourists the, going past? Selling produce off the side of the road? Yeah. Well, it started out that I wanted to earn pocket money. We had two kilo bags of apples. And so when I was about 10 or something, we'd sit out the front, put a sign by the end of the road and sit out the front and sell bags of apples to cars pulling in buying bags of apples off us as pocket money That's then crazy. we realized this works and so it developed and we started selling bags of apples and then mm. dad said oh well there we go that's seven minutes <laughs> keep going mate <laughs> um, then dad said oh how about we put some you know potatoes there or let's try some bananas or let's try some pears and people started buying all sorts of things and then he's like this is turning into something here. And so we built a permanent structure and a packing shed and a retail outlet on the road with a car park and the whole thing. And I remember putting the roof on that building when I finished school at the end of year 11. That was the first job I did was was nailing a roof on that building. Isn't it crazy just how organically things like that grow? Yeah. Yeah, and to be fair, my mum wasn't really behind it you know, but dad was pushing for it pretty hard. And eventually I picked up a fair chunk of it. And, you know, I still gave mum the urits a little bit, but, you know. Mm. Well, that's awesome. That's, uh, yeah, you drive past those things all the time on the highway and you just wonder how they even get started the, and are they the biggest, actually an enterprise? The biggest successful part of it um, was that our road led down the peninsula. So as soon as you had public holidays or yeah, school holidays, right. that road would be flooded with cars. And when it was at its busiest was summertime. So we had good mates who were growing um, nice stone fruit, like peaches and nectarines and plums and stuff. And we had access to that at the right rate. So we put it on the side of the road. Then people would stop and go, have a look at these peaches. And they'd pick up two or three kilo of each of these and put them in the fridge in their holiday houses. Do and you find now that's flowed on? Because, I mean, you know, without getting too into it, like we live in a culture now that's very big on processed food and all that sort of thing. So for you now as a family... Is there always fruit and veggies in the house? Yeah. It's flowed onto your kids and, you know, onto Helen? Definitely. definitely. You know, we we went to a market on the weekend and bought nothing but fresh produce <laughs> with a big, like, half kilo punnet of raspberries. Um, it's an awesome habit to have. Yeah, and figs. Mm. You know, like, you had all these nice sort of semi-coloured figs. And I said, how much do you want for your dark ones? He goes, oh, they're marked down, they're split. What people don't realise is those figs that have got so ripe are so full of sugar, those black genoa figs, and you split them open and eat them, they are beautiful. Absolutely yeah. beautiful. You've got to refrigerate them. That's an awesome habit to have. All right, question two. Three <laughs> reasons you get out of bed every morning. Go. Um, firstly, um, family. Yep. We all do stuff for our family, but, I, you know, it's a big driver for me to show that, not, not not to show just yeah I, I i got so much more i want to achieve with my family and so much more i want to show them and and take them to that getting out of bed in the morning helps me get towards that even if it's a small step you know and i, I know everybody relates to that and i don't want to carry on about it because i think everybody totally gets it you get out of bed for your family in the morning you know yourself included Kyle. Mm. Mm. Um, and i wrote down a couple of other things here too that gets me out of bed in the morning one is the unknown Mm -hmm. unknown do you know what tomorrow brings we can plan it out we know what's going to be in the calendar and we have some things booked out but taking on the unknown and accepting that um all sorts of you know uh interactions with people and events mm -hmm. and changes in our environment that that thrills me you know so I, with, I like it. spontaneity so with that in mind would you say you are a planner or you're a wing it, or you're a mixture of the two? Mixture of the two. Because I already know what I'm doing at 2 o'clock today. I know what I'm doing at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and 7 o'clock, and what time we'll be home for dinner and everything. But it's all of the changes and the different bits and pieces that come with it. Today included, you know, we talked about a time today. It took us a little while to get it right. <laughs> but here I am. We got, at a there, in the end. we got there in the end. 
a scheduled but, uh, time, having a great time doing something spontaneous. But you're not one of those people that knows what they're doing at two o'clock six months from now. You're no. not that much of a planner. That wall calendar will tell me that we've got certain events on, but no, I can't tell you that. Hmm. Yeah. So if something something doesn't go your way and you like if you have something planned at two o'clock today and it doesn't work out, are you finding the closest ball to throw at a wall or do you just go, I'll just wing it and we'll just go from there? Yeah, yeah, totally. Totally. And I, and that's the unknown to me. Yeah. You know, I've got to go and have a meeting with someone and I don't know what shape that's going to be in. And that's that's exciting. Yeah. Um great. And the number three. The third reason for me getting out in, out of bed in the morning is time. And I'm going to talk a little bit about time at the end. Um, you, know, you, you and I both realise that um, life is not infinite. You know, how much time have you got? Not just time today. And I'm not just talking about until until we pass away, till our life ends. But how much time do you have today and what are you prepared to do with it? You know? Yeah. I was um, I was really rarely sleep in, Kyle. Well, I was reading something a couple of days ago where we have this um, referral of quality time. And a lot of us refer to quality time as a weekend or in the evening. It's it's taking the quality time in what we would call the wasted time. So the quality time, like this right now is quality time. You know, picking your kids up and like you drive your kids to sport. You know, sitting in the car with them for an hour, that's quality time. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be a booked in event. It's just those little moments that, like I said, they're unplanned. They're totally winging it. And you go, God, that was fun. Yeah. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I'm totally with yeah. you. With that. You know, and, and while it's some people's jam to sit down and, and watch The Bachelor or, you know, and I see all, I hear people talking about television programs oh. and I'm like, well, I don't watch a lot of TV. If anything, no. I find a bit of time to watch the footy because I enjoy that. You know, AFL down here. But even then, like sometimes I'll sit back and watch a game of football that my team's not in and I'll just keep an eye on it and I'll be talking or I'll be cooking something or, you know, looking at my device and researching something, but still watching to see how Carlton's going or whatever, mm. you know. It's just in the background. And like you said, that's, but that's what you choose to spend your time on. And I'm the same. The, you, I think you just mentioned before about getting up early. I, five, six years ago, was not an early riser. Now I see the benefit so much of just getting to, bed, getting to bed early, getting up earlier. And by lunchtime, you've already got so much more achieved. Whereas, yeah, yeah. God, we all know those teenagers <laughs> and those other people that 10 in the morning, they're still in bed. But again, um, that's what they choose to do. Sometimes I get into bed at night and go, oh, God, I'm back here again. Hmm. That was me all last right, time. So let's, <laughs> all right, so let's do this bit so I can get up. Yep. It's almost like it's a task, getting sleep. Yeah, is yeah. A, I've is got to get into bed, you know, and I lay here and I go, just remind yourself, this is really comfortable. I'm laying in bed. Oh, how nice it is laying in bed. Okay, all right, bang, off to sleep. Whoop, it's time. Let's go. Buddy, bada bing, bada boom. Yep. Okay. Two guilty pleasures. Question three. Two I, guilty pleasures that you have. I only ended up with one. That's okay. It's all right. It, yeah, it, it um at our wedding, and this became apparent to me. I I, I was probably semi conscious of it, <laughs> but um, you know, like uh, when you're married and you walk out of the ceremony, and we had ours in a local hall. Mm. Um, walked out, had best family and friends around us and stuff. And, you know, the corsages come up, you know, the little flower things that people give and, you know, little things you hang around the wrist of the bride and all that sort of stuff. Well, my dad came up and he gave me a wooden spoon with a bow on it. And I looked at him went like this and he goes, <laughs> keep stirring them up, son. And I've <laughs> discovered I'm, I'm a perpetual stirrer. Like I will, <laughs> and not, you know, it's easy to, get a negative connotation on that to be an agitator and to stir and question everything. But I, I like teasing and I like questioning things, you know, and you and I have, have some mutual friends like that as well, that just like to wiggle in and poke a bit of fun, you know? And I think that's, uh, you know, my father, my father was much the same and some of my fondest memories of him were actually him just giving me shit, yeah. but um, they're fond memories, but yeah, you're right. And I think, I think one good thing about us with that, it shows that we're like, there are times to be serious, 
but there are also times where we can just be a little bit lighthearted. We don't yeah. have to be serious all the time. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm also um, researching the art of questioning at the moment mm. too. So when I find something that's that's difficult to deal with with someone or or a, a situation that you know, instead of forcing my view, I'll ask a question instead. You know, like say, um, you know, you and I have met for the very first time, and it's because my car's run into your car, and you get out and you're all upset and everything, and I'm like, oh Jesus, you know, I'll mm. say, you know, are you okay? Yeah, good. Okay, I'm. You know, I'm I'm sorry that we've banged into each other and everything. Um, how long have you had your car? So I'll use a question to break things down a little bit instead of uh, a question like, um, why the hell did you run into me? Instead, I'll appeal to the person or ask something about them that I'm prepared to learn learn from them or learn about them. So to show you, them, yeah. to, to get us to a point where they're willing to, you know, speak as a person, I think. So one of your other, one of one of Peter's other talents is he works in community radio. And uh, is it once a week, every Monday, every yeah, Monday morning? Once a week, yeah. Now, you've probably done your fair share of interviews there and you've spoken to people and you've had a couple of MC gigs and all that sort of thing. Um, do you find by transferring that sort of interviewing procedure into conversations do you find that you get more out of a conversation? So like, for example, when you said, why, you know, you say to someone who just hit your car, why did you run into me? Well, it's not like I meant to, mate. Yeah, you know, that's right. Again, you immediately show that compassion, whereas a lot of us just go straight to blame, don't we? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think a lot of things, I don't know, I, I could turn around and say, oh, radio or doing community radio for such a long time as... Um, you know, has caused me to be a certain way. But if anything, it's a practice tool for, for myself, you know, to to develop myself as well, you know, to, to to be able to have a conversation with a stranger on a phone who I might never even lay eyes on or have someone come in the studio and talk to them about something or, you know, just to portray things across an audio medium or something, you know. And even this, this is a good challenge for me as well, you know. I guess it's like any job, isn't it? Like if we're... If we're a doctor, then we must be very good at following procedures and protocols. If we're, uh, you know, if we're a tradesman, we're very good at making sure we're planning things out because everything must be done in a certain order. And that can't help but transfer into our personal, personal and private life as well. Yeah, I just see it as a, a uh, it's a great hobby. It's a lot of fun, but mm. it's also good for self development as well. You know, and I like how the the skills uh, transfer between different occupations and and outcomes 100 mm. percent um yeah, if you can hear that on the podcast can you hear that no oh okay we're we're fi- just the background we're filming at uh the office at the gym at cma and we have a uh, very cool alarm on our clock now that seems to play a mixture of seven or eight different tunes every hour so when you're trying to really be stern and gruff in the middle of a uh, class and you get London Bridge is falling down playing over on the <laughs> doesn't, doesn't go well. It took anyway. me ages, but I finally found a doorbell that you can put whatever you like to as the doorbell. Oh no. So you can put music or a yeah. voice recording oh. or a sound effect. Oh, you need to send me a link for that. That'd be very that's, good. That's bloody good. And it shocks people because we change it every now and then. It, and at the moment. At the moment, our doorbell sounds like this because it's my voice this time. Before it was Henry's. Henry had a thing. Oh, what was it? No, mom, dad, Jack, man. Uh, someone's at the door. Go and see. You know, it was that yelling out sort of thing. There's somebody you... would ring the doorbell and that would go off in the house. You've at seen moment... Ferris Bueller's Day Off, haven't you? Oh, yeah, but what's the detail? You know, when they ring the doorbell and it's, hello, who is it? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. I can't. <laughs> That's just immediately what I saw. <laughs> All right. Number four. I was going to tell you, hang on. Oh, I've got yeah, to finish yeah. this. The doorbell at the moment sounds like this. Excuse me, sir. There's someone at the door. <laughs> Rush up there and see who it is. <laughs> Have you, what's, what's the comments been like on that so far, mate? Well, I had a friend who was visiting the other day and he didn't know anything about it. He was in the house and somebody rang the doorbell and he was just walking through the house and he went, 
<laughs> what am I hearing here? <laughs> Good. Oh my God. Remind me not to ring your doorbell next time I'm down. Yep. Um, now, number four, one thing that you bought or have bought that has literally made you happy every day after that. Man, I put down two things. Oh, all right. So you got one no. guilty pleasure, but you got two things. Pete, first podcast and you're breaking the rules. Seriously. Oh, I know. I know. It's all right. Carry on. Carry on. I'm just gonna say, I'm just gonna say one thing that will, that will get slid slid to the end, but I I will just hustle this one. It's my record player. I bought a record player when I was a teenager, and I've had one ever since. That makes me happy every single week. It is probably the one longest device or physical thing in my life that I've continued to use. How many and it's times the second one upgraded? Oh, that's I was going to say. So they you've two upgrades, one upgrade of the first one, and then the second one was a few years ago. So I've had two really good record players. This one will outlive. So you literally had the same record player playing the same records for how many years before you upgraded? Uh, um, you know, twenty five years. Jesus. <laughs> the interesting thing is. And this is again a weird, maybe a different way of looking at it. So that record player would have played different genres of music, different evolutions in music. Your kids' records, you know, records would have been played that now your kids play, you know. So it's funny how, like you said, that one inanimate object has such a dynamic role in your family. Yeah. Yes. Very interesting. Yeah. Now what's so the I'll leave the others. Well, it's a sort of a two-part thing. We go camping whenever we go camping or we go to a music festival. There's two things that I take with me that, that are invaluable. One is my Coleman uh, 360 um, space shelter. <laughs> so it's not your normal marquee that's up and square. Like a, oh, like a, I know the one. I know the and one. They do that. And and you can shift the walls around in them so you can block off some wind. Mm. Mate, the best thing. And it goes up and comes down like nothing. And... It is looking game very changer. worn. <laughs> game changer. Yeah, game changer. Um, and the other one is an esky that I bought. Um, I don't know whether you get them up there, up in uh, in Queensland, but mm. a Techni Ice esky down here, mm. which has the hard plastic walls in it, really thick. Mm. Well, this one is what probably one point two long, the width of a normal esky, but it's as high as a two liter milk container. Oh. So you can put two layers of cans in it or you can put a two-litre um, bottle of milk in it and close the lid so it's long and it is so good. So when I go away somewhere, um, you know, for four or five days or something like that, I might use two, three bags of ice, but it just stays cold. It is yeah, dead. Right. You know, it cost me, I don't know, a few hundred bucks or whatever it was. And, I, you know, you, you carry around a crappy esky for a long time and then I bought one of these. And I just went, man, I am so happy I've had this. It's made me happy ever since I bought it. <laughs> now, when you do go away, those things just make their way to the car automatically? Yeah, yeah, the Coleman and Maneski. And how often would you use, like, so, you know, what's your constitution, you know, what's your, uh, what, sorry, what's your criteria? So more than, a, more than one night, that stuff's automatically in the car? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Oh, you know, if we're going away and, and got accommodation somewhere, I won't take the Coleman, but um, we're going away this weekend and the Esky will go straight in the back. And it's just got its place. Yeah, it sits right across the back. <laughs> you know, and if, um, if I'm driving and Helen wants a beer, you open up the back of the car, there's one right there for you. <laughs> in, in summertime, we have a nice outdoor area. And, um, you know, when it comes to Christmas, and we start with the club Christmas party. Mm. And I, you know, I lay on some drinks and everything, and I fill up that esky with ice and all sorts of different drinks. And then our family Christmases go through, and so we just keep putting things in there. And I start running ice blocks out of my freezer in the garage, and just keep rotating ice blocks and keep it cold. And generally, we get to about you know January fifteen, <laughs> and everything. I go, well, I can probably open up this esky and give it a clean out now because stuff just rotates through there. And we're sitting outside so much and we're barbecuing and coming back from the beach and you crack a beer or, you know, there's a bottle of champagne in there or something. And it's just always sitting out there cold, you know. It's funny how just those like, and this is the reason I put the question in because everyone will have these different things, but 
just to someone else, something that's so trivial has brought someone else so much practicality and joy. Yeah. You know, there'd be people listening to this that don't even own an Esky. Yeah. It's like Wayne's, <laughs> Wayne's World. I don't even own a gun, let alone yes. enough guns yeah. to Techni necessitate over an entire rack. And Techni Ice, if you like the plug, you know where to find me. <laughs> we'll be working on product placement in future podcasts. Coleman, Coleman, the Coleman sun shelters are really good too. <laughs> I need a new one. Hey, you need to calm down. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Number five. One thing everyone thought you were crazy doing, you did it anyway, and it paid off. Uh -huh. Oh, oh man, this is um, this is a, a tricky one. Yep. There's one that um, there were a couple of people who who thought I was doing the right thing. Yep. And um, and, and but most people went, oh, no, no, that's going to work. Um, but a teenage class for my karate club, you know, it used to be. Yeah, you even go to some karate clubs or martial arts clubs and it's adults and kids together. And that, you know, that is that is just, it doesn't work for me. I don't want to work. slam it. it. Doesn't, well, it doesn't work for a lot of people. And I think what we find is, you know, and your club is the same as mine, uh, once it grows to a certain capacity, it's just impractical. Yeah, but then going yeah, to yeah. a teenage class is another step again. So I had kids and I had adults. And then there were these kids who were growing up and too big for the kids' class and too small for the adults. And I went, oh, I'm just going to start a teenage class. So if they're at secondary school, they join the teenage class until they look at me in the eye. They're the same height as me. And I say, now you're in with the adults, regardless that you're in year 10, son. In you go. Um, yep. uh, you know, and I'm not as abrupt with that as I sound, but, you know, it's a, you know, it's a process to eventually get them in with the adults. But making that teenage class, it is now... The, the strongest one of the strongest classes that I have and I'm really glad I did it and people question it a, a little bit you know one well, like so the people who, of course the people who questioned it why what were they what was the questioning probably because they tried the model before or you know it was unconventional I think maybe was there a was there a time where you sort of thought was this a good idea Oh, there's been times where I'm standing in front of, you know, half a dozen teenagers thinking, wow, this class is really thin. Hmm. Then I remind it myself that it's... would go through waves, of course, wouldn't it? I mean, like, there's a, there's I, a period. I guess so. But um, the worst time for teenagers to train is school holidays. Yeah. We're at school holidays right now, and that class is decimated. Yeah. They're all off doing stuff. They don't even know what day it is. Yeah. But guarantee the school routine starts. They're and I'll have five kids in there. Yeah, right. That's good. Um, is it something that, you know, any other martial arts club owners listening to here, is it something that you would recommend just to persist with because it will pay off? Oh, absolutely. And there, there needs to be a, a few little, you know, we won't get into this now, but there's some real cultural items that you need to observe in there as well, some some serious stuff that is well worth embracing that makes those kids so happy and when they're happy they'll listen and then you've got their ear and you can you can guide them you can coach them as not only a human but also as a good martial artist yeah and just my future instructors are in that room yeah exactly right you know they're the they're the ones that will end up teaching the classes not always necessarily the adults yeah for sure okay that's cool six number six Four things you cannot live without, animate or inanimate. <laughs> I wrote down three. <laughs> Mate, one job. <laughs> all right, all right. I'll probably come up with a fourth one. Um, four things that I cannot live without. Um, uh, people, first. COVID taught me a lot about myself. Yep. And the disconnection um, from people going into lockdown, you know, we had some nasty lockdowns here for quite a few weeks where you couldn't travel any further than five kilometres away from your home. And I ended up, um, or we ended up in this street, in this little country town, or this this um, seaside town that I live in. All the people in the street have all become really, really close now. You know, so much so that we had a dinner and a wine tasting all together. Obviously, there was 16 of us in a room the other night, all just hanging out because we liked each other's company. Mm. We know and trust each other. There's a message group 
Like last night, um, somebody was looking for lemons and then somebody else was looking for thyme and somebody was looking for, this and, you know, and it's just popping up on the message group or somebody's out of cream, you know? Mm. Um, so people, but what I did discover is it wasn't just people that I missed, it was the feedback from people. So not only you, know, you and I train in a, or, or work in a really physical environment where you feel feedback all the time. Yeah. You know, the push, the pull, the, all that stuff through martial arts, but also the feedback of how you're traveling, you know, like a, how's your day going? Oh, my day's going okay. Getting that feedback from someone, um, I really miss that. So being left insular to just my family, it eventually became a little bit um, wearing between the members of my close-knit family that, you know, we're all going through the same sort of thing and getting the same feedback from them all the time was was you know, I suppose a bit grating for all of us. So with that in mind, would you say that COVID lockdown in particular that was like take away the business side of it or anything like that, but on a personal mental health level, that was tough for you? Tough. Yeah, I think it was a bit in the end. You know, I was, I was getting pretty sad from a business sitting at the side started to wear really thin yeah the you know, the worst thing was was we go into a lockdown then they say okay we're coming out and i go right let's go let's get change their mind get things going again oh lockdown and that happened like three four times well well melbourne in particular didn't that end up being the most lockdown city in the world yeah and i guess you and your like your regional victoria so you probably weren't far behind really i guess no no we weren't classed as regional victoria they oh. call us metro there you go. So I can uh, sit here and look at the road out the front of my house, a dirt road, and I won't see a car go by for an hour. And <laughs> probably a dog asleep on it, but we're metro. <laughs> that's one definition that's one is thing. an interesting thing. Number two. Number two, food. Yeah. But I don't just mean food. Like we we all need food to survive, but good quality food and it and it we talking about that wine tasting we had on the weekend. We had an expert come in and talk to us about all the different wines of the peninsula and and um, why those wines are so good and because of the soil structure and the climate and the year and everything that affects a really good wine. And it made me wake up to how much I really love food again. So automatically in the last few days, I've gone, Helen, let's get a let's get a block of really good cheese. You know, or we get some pate, you know, or something that's really nice. It's easier to just pull into Macca's or KFC and eat cardboard. It's funny. I've it's had it's this, way more enjoyable to have quality food. I've had this a lot too. Like I've had to reassess a lot lately of what I'm eating and what I'm putting into my body, which is another conversation. But it's funny how quickly people will shy away from good food because the first thing they look at is the price tag. Mm. don't look at how like if something is good it it more than likely will cost more but if you eat good food and from your sense that sort of behavior would have you know probably been instilled in you from you know you're eating an apple that you picked off a tree yourself didn't buy it at Coles and god knows where it came from yep. that sort of you know if you eat good food then you are good and you're healthy aren't you yeah yeah yeah, so still sourcing and, and exploring. At the weekend, went up to a market, um, went to the Shoreham Market, and there was a mushroom grower there. And I went over and started looking at it. And without telling him, you know, what I knew about mushrooms, I was looking at his pink oyster, his white oyster, he had king oyster. He had this, had that, sold out of shiitake. And he had some lion's mane there. Now, I know lion's mane's all the rage at the moment, but I've never actually had any. I knew about it 20 years ago, but there it was. And I went, oh, I said, I oh, can I have that lion's mane? He goes, yeah. And then we got talking about mushrooms. They're in the fridge. Mm. And I'm going to be slicing that up and cooking that in butter and garlic and put it across with some eggs on toast and stuff and really taste it and enjoy it, you know? And like I said to you earlier about the kids and food, do you think that sort of habit of them wanting to cook and enjoy good food, that's that's starting to emerge in them as well? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Excellent. Yeah, they're not they're not fast food guys, which I'm really proud of. Yeah, I lo I love that. With our like our kids understand it's a it's a treat, but yeah, definitely not something that they have every day. Now, Jack, um, my son's got into um, working out in the gym a lot, and 
and and heavy lifting and stuff, you know, and he is driven by protein and nutrients and studying up on it pretty hard as well. Good, He's becoming man. a big lad, but I tell you what, the um uh, the beef content has gone up in the house. <laughs> beef, beef consumption has gone up in the house. <laughs> Got a, you're gonna have a you're gonna oh, have yeah. a couple of head of gonna have a couple of head of cattle out the back there, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Number three. Music. Of course. I would expect nothing less. For oh, those well, who are, don't know Peter very well, he is a avid, avid music follower. It's how we actually initially connected that in martial arts. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, yeah, still hunting, still enjoy sourcing new music and discovering and even listening, Not, I shouldn't say even, and listening to other broadcasters and what they're discovering as well. Mm. Um, if a friend of mine has just picked up the prime slot on the number one community radio station in the world, Triple R F M here in Melbourne. And Annalise now has um the ghost time slot, which is a, a highly regarded time slot on Friday afternoons from and I've given her a big plug here. Yeah. But between four and seven on Friday afternoons, and I'm really interested in what Annalise brings to that show. You know, she comes from a different background and also um um, just has a wealth of knowledge in music as well. So I, I enjoy listening to her program mm. and I enjoyed listening to the ghosts. And um, and I also um, will listen to the um, the streaming versions of, of Roland's program overseas as well because he shares so much fresh punk and stuff that I haven't discovered. So I'm still crawling. I'm still trawling through radio, oh, through radio, through music. Um, and there's a little band down here on the peninsula called Doe Street and they're going to release their first um, full-length album uh, in two days' time. <laughs> and I'll be chasing up that. Yeah, I did. I just looked at the date now, and in two days' time that gets released, and I'll be booking myself a copy of that. Even though I've, I've got a little um, bit of access to what it sounds like, I still want that record, you know. As far as music goes, your musical taste you're not limited to one genre? No, nah, no, I don't think so. <laughs> well, the reason I ask that is there, there's a lot. And I mean, look, we've discussed music at length. There's a lot of bands that I've listened to since I was a, a kid and the music I grew up on is probably a lot different to other kids. When other kids were getting nursery rhymes, I was getting the Sex Pistols and the Jam and the Damned and that sort of stuff. But the thing I notice now is my music taste i'm listening to the same style or same styles of music but now the newer versions of that sort of music is yeah. your kids your kids listen to your music or do your kids listen to their own music both yeah both same. Which I'm really happy with same mm. yeah they'll be playing a bit of my old stuff and we'll sing some and we've got a playlist that's called um uh, road, road trip sing alongs. No, oh. <laughs> they just stuff that you like to hear in the car and sing while you're driving, and it's their input as well, you know. And they yeah. sing those songs. And if we, we put it on the other day and went, Oh, god, this one sucks, that's off, you know. So we kicked it out. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're 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 finding their own music as well, and I'll hear it coming from the bathroom at 10 o'clock at night when they're having a shower oh, before they go to bed, and, nice. and you're like, you know, you're like. You know, we're trying to go to sleep. Do you know what I notice now is the stuff that my mother was saying to me between the ages of, you know, 12 to 17 is exactly what I'm saying to my kids now. <laughs> you have to play the music in every single room that you're in. Yeah, Do you right. have to take the speaker to the shower every single time? Is every that, night. does that have to happen? Yeah. Yep. That's what I was doing. Yeah. You know. Number mm. four. Uh, number four, if you were doing, I'll do this part, okay? Okay, okay, okay. If you were not doing what you are doing in life right now, what, uh, uh, what would you, sorry, what would have been option number two? <laughs> do that really well, radio announcer. Madison's laughing at you. <laughs> <laughs> so what would I be doing if I wasn't doing what I'm doing right now? Mm -hmm. Um, filmmaking or acting, I think. Okay. Yeah, um, there was a point when I was at uh, at the orchard or leaving school and, and my dad was encouraging me to um, to become a fruit grower. He wanted me to take on the orchard and everything. And 
and uh, the phone rang and it was a drama teacher from my high school saying, look, they're putting together a group of people to go up to Sydney and put on a show up there. Would I be interested? And this was lunchtime working at the Orchard, my parents, and I'm on the phone and I'm like, what do you think? Dad's like, oh, I've got too much work to do. <laughs> I'm like, you know, really like, hmm. And I'm like, oh, oh, oh. and I said, oh, maybe next time. And I put that phone down. Right. And that, and that was my little window where I reckon I would have either gone towards the performing arts or stay in the orchard and end up where I am today. You know, who knows? I might have ended up in the same place, you know. Who knows? But um, I, I was really keen on um, becoming an actor and I was keen on becoming a filmmaker after that as well. So that's probably where I would have ended up. So my question, have you ever ruled it out completely? <laughs> um oh i've got him on the spot here people yeah have got me on the spot <laughs> i it hurts to say it but i think yeah I, i'm not sure my lifestyle now would would take that kind of commitment maybe it just wasn't yeah. meant to be maybe yeah i i still get to perform i still do my radio i still stand up in front of a class and carry on like a goose well i guess we are uh... Yeah, and we're we're performing for other reasons, aren't we? Yeah. You know, we're both in martial arts, and I'm strong on the word arts. Art is expression. 100%. You know, and you're either expressing yourself with a, with a pen or a paintbrush or with a camera or, you know, with, with, um, with a belt on mm. or, you know, art is expression. To be able to express yourself and have people be interested in that expression, then yep. I think it's a real art. I think you're right. I think you're totally right. Question seven. If you were not doing what you're doing in life right now, well, what would have been option number two? Does that bring us back to number four a bit or is there something else there? And didn't we just do that one? No, no, I'm sorry. Yes, that's what we did do. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Do you want me to answer it again? I was, you know what? I was really, <laughs> I was thinking about your acting thing. Yeah. I was, um, because that is something that, dare I say it, that is something that I could really see you doing. And we've never had that conversation before. So, mm. yeah. I don't I don't let that on too much. So you've done well, Kyle. Yeah, I could. Um, I, like, I like to tease my wife every now and then and say, if I'd have been an actor, I would have won an Academy Award. Oh, I was going to say, I thought you could, don't you know who you're talking to? No, no. <laughs> uh, and, Hel and Helen's always like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll say, I would have won it. I would have driven for it. I would <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. All right. Number eight. Here we go. Yep. The big one. One time you have backed yourself when everything was saying to just give up. It's funny. I, I don't know whether I've ever had... Well, no, I suppose I have. This, yeah, this one, the answer is martial arts mm. and um, heading towards martial arts on a professional level and doing it completely and thoroughly in my life as part of my life and making it my life. Mm. Nobody was telling me to give that up. Uh, you know, I remember years ago, my dad always used to say, you'll never make money out of that bloody karate stuff. You know, and it wasn't a matter of rubbing his nose in it. I, I just drove my passion towards what I really loved and, it, and it's brought its benefits. There are several systems of martial arts that have had little voices in the back of my head what saying, just give up. Just don't go to that anymore. Hmm. But you and I both know that dedication and self-discipline and self-control and commitment to something brings great rewards, you know, and, 100%. um, you know, you get tested physically with that and mentally and spiritually to some points as well. But we know that if we muscle on and get past those challenging parts, there's quite often, you know, golden lakes in front of you. There's, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot that comes from not yeah. giving up as well. And a friend of ours calls it, I think he calls them a white belt moment where you just get this little, little epiphany. What, um, oh, look, I, I know I've had a few of these moments. 
but was there any times when you went, I'm going to give this martial arts stuff a go full time or, you know, start here and see where it goes. How many times have you, or did you just stop and go, you know, this is, this is shit. What was I, what was I thinking? How did I possibly think that I could, I could do this? Was it How yesterday? many times have I had that thought? <laughs> Cause I mean, I, and I mean, we both, we both, you know, have busy lives. We both run busy clubs. I think I still have those moments. You know, I probably had, I had one moment. I probably had one of those moments, I think not even a week ago where I'm just going, what am I doing? Yeah. You know, but then what else do we do? Oh, no, there's plenty of other things to do, but um, <laughs> the other things to do. Stopping but, is an option, isn't it? No, it's, it's, it's all part of it. It's part of the, um, Part of the large organism that we're working working with and working towards. It is, man. Um, to be to be thoroughly good at something and to feel good to feel good at doing it, it, it's it's incredibly rewarding towards your self esteem and your your character and and that in turn helps other people. And then when you realise that you can help people by having that sort of positivity in your life and everything, well, then life gives back to you a little bit again as well. So it's not only just good for me and then people see I feel happy about it and I, I'm a greater person, I can help people a little bit, then it's that pebble in the pond thing where it starts to affect the people around you, you know. It's us remembering how much energy we have by just being ourselves, you know, and mm. if we have this energy, if we're, you know, like you said about your teenagers, if you're committed to them and you're showing how much you're putting in, 90% of them can't help but just, feed off that and just reciprocate back yep and then you you know i've had it happen to me i'm sure you've had it happen to you 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 run into a someone that you taught as a kid who's now in their late 20s or 30s and they remember that one conversation that you had with them and this and this and you told me this and then we did this and i still talk to people about it and you're nodding and smiling going i have no idea which what when this was but they remembered it and it's it's stuck with them forever. Yeah. Yeah. They're the moments that are uh, the not the not giving up wasn't an option. You remember we were talking to Dave Kovar there, um, who's one of our mentors in martial arts, and mm. he was talking about it and he got us all to write down a name of a person who said those things to us that we have yeah. never forgotten in our life, you know. And I remember Mr. Goncharov, the brass teacher that told me I was really talented at playing the trumpet. Mm. I was talented at playing music. And I have never forgotten him. And the lesson that Kovar was talking about was it is okay to be that person. Yeah. You can go and be Mr. Goncharov. You can be that person who had that big impact on your life because, and keep saying that stuff because you don't know how many people you're affecting and putting Correct. positivity into. And they will turn around and say, I remember Kyle Reaver because he said something to me about myself once. 100%. Just mm. by being us. All right, we got two to go. Question nine. Three pieces of advice to people that are finding reasons to not back themselves, to instead back themselves. Yeah. Uh, back yourself because um, why not? Because the rewards are immeasurable. If you think you can measure one outcome um, by backing yourself, you say, right, I am going to do this and I can see that it, just by doing it, this short-term outcome is going to be okay. You know, I'll get this small reward or this thing, you know, will give back to me. You actually can't measure the amount and the effect that it has going on further on from here. Mm -hmm. So bloody well back yourself and have a real dip. Yep. Because you're definitely, or we all are, um, short-sighted in that outcome. But let me tell you, my friend, you don't know what's over the hill and where it's going to take you after that because I still pinch myself where my life has ended up now. And I'm grateful. Hundred percent. And we all are. Uh, we yeah. all. Have so I wrote down here. I wrote down here. Why not? As it's immeasurable. Correct. What's the other two? Happiness. Base all of your decisions on happiness and happiness only. Very good. Very good. You know, if you can say, "Oh no, no, I should base it on my family." Well, it's, let me tell you as well. You'll be happy if your family's happy. Correct. That's very true. They won't be. Don't worry about it. Don't, they don't won't be happy if you're not happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know we all worry about money. 
And I know we all worry about health, but as long as you're happy, wealth, money will happen. And uh, health-wise, you're going to be a better person. And like I say, it affects everything going on around you. So if you, know, if you feel light, my friend Maz and I talk about this, if you feel lightness in your shoulders and in your body based on a decision, well, you're in the right place. And those signals will pop up to you as well, like you're, you've made the right decision. And one thing I saw recently, wealth and money are two very different things. A lot of people say wealth and they think instantly monetary. Wealth yeah. wealth is not really that at all. Yeah. Third one? Third one is my favourite. And I had to have, uh, have this chat with someone recently. I'm going to get a bit of paper here. And I'm going to do a little interactive thing with you now, Kyle. Oh, Jesus. I'm going to draw a line on this paper, which represents your life. Mm -hmm. Okay, there is your life. He's pretty sure. You start out. At the age of zero, what age are you going to do? You think you'll be passing away, Kyle? Oh, uh, doesn't matter. I'd like to think I get eighty-five. Eighty-five? Yeah. Going to give it a push. Go to ninety, mate. Yeah, all right. Okay. We'll all right. Well, let's put ninety down the end there. Okay. Is that? Uh, can you read this? <laughs> can you read that, or is that back to front to you? No, that's right way for me. Okay, excellent. So there is your life, zero to ninety. Right. So right in the middle is what? Obviously. 45? 45? Yeah. Uh, 45. Yeah. Okay, so if we break 45 in half is what, say, 22, and mm -hmm. in between that is 11, and there's 33. Yeah. So everybody can see that at home, right? Roger that. Right there. Okay, so we're about to you. We, fair to say you're near the 45 mark, Kyle? Oh, look, Peter, to be perfectly honest, I'm just a touch past it. <laughs> all right, all right. So we're going to put going to put a little circle, a little dark mark there right where you are so you understand where you are. Let's just call it that, right? Thank you. Cool. Now, in this first, here comes, here comes the bit that's important. Right. Your life here, from zero to 11. Man, what are we doing from zero to 11? Mm. One, you learn, how to, you learn how to walk, you learn how to talk, you learn how to feed yourself, how to not crap your pants. Mm. <laughs> that's important. Yeah, how to how to learn nutrition, how to how to do all these different things in between eleven. That's nearly the end of primary school. You can read, you can write, you can uh, apply it to certain things around your life. You've decided what you like. You decide the country and western could be okay for you. Country and western music. <laughs> you know, <laughs> From that's eleven, a, that's a given. That's a given. Eleven to twenty-two, man, man. Eleven to twenty-two. How much happened in there, Kyle? I don't, I don't think we need to talk about that on air. <laughs> well, what a learning curve. Oh, learning. I mean, in here, some really, really strong basic stuff. But from 11 to 22, we started to apply this and test it out, challenge the boundaries of thinking and and what was right, what was wrong. And then it went 22, 33, started mm. to really consolidate. 33 to 45, man, we, we reckon we got a pretty good handle on it. You are bloody well kill it. kidding yourself, mate. You're only halfway. There you go. Have a look at how much you have done in this part here. You've only just started. If you can think how smart you've become between zero and this 45 mark and all of the things that you've achieved in here, you are going to be amazing by this. So when do you think, so I'm going to reverse this back to you. How do you feel you turned uh, the big 5-0 not terribly long ago? <laughs> if you were to do this diagram on yourself. Yeah. How do you feel? Just like that. I feel like, man, I'm only halfway through. You know, and, and my body is going to try and restrict me. That's, your main, that's your main variable, isn't it? Yeah, that's my, my variable. But geez, I gotta get going, you know. Mm. I, yeah, I got all this. I'm halfway through here. If if I sit back and think about all of the things that I have done up until this this age right now, and maybe I'm only going to do half of those things or achieve things on the same level, and yeah. get half of them done by the time I I finish up. Holy shit! There's a lot. There's so much. So when you have those teenagers or you know those people that come to you. And I mean, we all have them. The I've I've done nothing with my life. 
and you map it out like that, do you think that makes a couple of them stop and take that into account? I was talking to a young man the other day who was having very dark thoughts and he openly admitted that and I spoke to him for quite a while and we talked about things and then I grabbed the stick and I said, come over here, mate. And I drew a line on the ground and Thank went God, through that I thought process. You, were going to you beat him with it or something. Though. No, no. And we just got it down and I drew the line and I said, here you are, here's this, here's this. And I mapped it out and I gave him that timeline and he realized he was only back there. And I said, man, do you have any idea what's coming towards you in the next 10 years? Yeah. And that's only up until, you know, in your 20s. You have so much to achieve and you have only just started. Don't wrap this whole negative thought around this point in time because it is so small. It is so small. From from here on, there is an endless amount of possibilities of what's going to happen in your life and how great they can be. I can see you really... Everything on one little point. I can see you're really passionate about this. And this is something a little bit off topic. Our job, and that is what it is, our job as martial arts instructors, is we often have these sorts of conversations with students or friends or anything like that that we gather an attachment to because we can't help because we spend that time with them. When we were going back to, you know, how you were talking earlier about Dave Kovar and how we have this impact, do you feel privileged that you get the opportunity to have a conversation with a young person like that and just help them see that from someone like you who has to live their life every day in a manner where they're trying to make the most of their time, that you get to pass on just that little bit of knowledge and hopefully that it turns things around. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know whether I feel privileged. I feel, um, how do I feel? feel grateful that that right. I may, I've made an Im- impact I feel really grateful that um that he that he listened hmm hmm because they can choose not to can't they yeah yeah That's you know so yeah I mean the, the alternatives no good the alternatives not an option no no so you know being able to you know, hand a message to someone like that and have them listen and care enough that it has an impact on them. I'm grateful, you know. And the fact that they have the respect that even if they don't want to take it all on board, that they're willing to at least listen. Yeah. That's an, you know, I guess, like I said, um, grateful. I guess that's an opportunity for us all. Yeah. All right. Number 10, a quote to live by, Peter, a quote to live by. (laughs) Technique before power. Mm. Technique oh. before power. How so? Okay. Uh, what's what's something that's really difficult for you to do at the moment, Kyle? I know this is an on-the-spot question. <laughs> something that you really like to, to be on top of. Uh, could be a relationship. It could be cooking something. It could be okay. podcast. For me, for me at the moment, with a few things I got going on, um, exercise just being able to exercise solidly and consistently it's at least another six weeks until i can have any sort of um contact on my body with where i'm at at the moment so your knowledge of physical training would tell you that um you launching yourself into a physical training regime um will that help you Uh, and you know like going out at 100 mile an hour no it's not going to end well at all peter so go back to your technique that you know solidly to help you improve your fitness and the power will come for free at the end. Mm. So go back to technique before power. Put technique well before power and eventually that momentum will, will grow. Um, yeah. If you learn to ride a bike, you remember when you first learned to ride a bike, you got on and it was wobbly, you're falling off and you see kids learning today, learning how to ride a bike. If you say, Ruddy, are you going to learn a bike? I'm going to shove you down the hill. You're going to go 100 mile an hour down the hill because it's all about power on a bike. How's that going to end? That's going to go horribly. So <laughs> you wife, have to first. My wife learn. will tell you a story about that that did, didn't end well at all. <laughs> you know, motorbikes, skateboards, you name it. They're really, really good examples of technique before power. Do you think technique before power is getting lost a little bit in this day and age? We're wanting to go power before technique? 
oh, I know whether it's a day and age thing. I think it's a human flaw. I think you know we 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 should remind ourselves to just slow down and do a better job on things yeah you know, be thorough give yourself space and time to do it really really well yeah but in a in a time where everything seems to be a need to get everything done faster there's an app for that there's a there's a cheat <laughs> there's a hack are we losing the experience of actually just having the experience of doing something like the technique before power there yeah I don't know. I don't know whether we're losing it. I, like I say, I think it's always going to exist because we get excited, excited by things being done fast, and we think that by trying to learn it fast, we end up being able to do it fast. But we know that we're not going to get that end result. Well, yeah, yeah, we know that we're not going to get that end result by practicing it fast. There's only one way to practice. That's practice slow until it builds momentum, until you do it so easily, and then you're doing it fast, and that's when you get the real excitement yeah um and i think if you do that enough times doing it slowly at the start actually gives you that excitement at the start to know and see yourself develop and grow and for you and martial arts again like i said you're you've been doing martial arts for a long time you're still able to do martial arts you're diving into a new martial art have been for a couple of years now Mm. technique before power in that sense is more present for you than maybe it has been in a very long time been a huge reminder you know i've always said it in my classes i've always used it and reminded people of it and here it is staring me right in the face yeah 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 but it's it's the same you apply it to anything you know you try you try and make a cake fast Mm. Mm. you know you, you turn around and try and okay so you want to develop a relationship with someone you're a little bit keen on say we're not married or you know, a young person's watching this or something and you're really keen on that other person, um, try and go about it 100 mile an hour. Yeah, see how that goes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. See how that goes. <laughs> so technique before power. Use your technique. All right. So that's our 10 questions. And for those that are new to this, which is everyone, that's how our format for our podcast will generally roll. Over time, we'll change our 10 questions. And uh, when we change the 10 questions, we might bring Pete on for number two. Um, I just want to make sure everyone uh, is very grateful because I'm very grateful for the amount of time that Mr. Peter Smedley has spent with me today. Um, mate, Thanks thank for you. inviting me along, mate, you know. We've been friends for a long time. We are, Pete and I are about to, um, with another, with a lot of other people in a group, we're about to go to Thailand. I think this will be the third third time we're in thailand together is yeah, that? yeah yeah yep. so we'll be in there for a couple of weeks well no how, doubt. Old were, how old were you when when we first met Cole? Ooh, i think i would have been i think i'm thinking i'm probably thinking at least i'm thinking at least 14 13 14 years ago so what would that have been so about the age of 30 oh jeezy tiger about early 40s. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Are you drawing another diagram? The red indicates how long you and I have been doing things oh, together. Oh, God. How much more have we got to do, mate? Let's just say, Peter, I'm thankful that between the 11 and 22 mark, maybe we weren't doing <laughs> things together <laughs> because it could have been a lot different. <laughs> Peter Smedley. Thank you so much for your time today. No worries. Um, Thanks for having me, mate. I hope everybody's enjoyed um, us two rattling on for quite a while. No, it's been fun. And thank you to everyone for listening. Um, Please follow, like, share, distribute these podcasts around. There'll be more to come. And I uh, look forward to many more times doing podcasts and I look to many more chats with Mr. Smedley. But for now, Peter Smedley, the voice of the peninsula, It's time to say goodbye. And remember, I always say at the end of my radio show, if you like what you heard, put out the word. Oh, boom. (laughs) We're off. Goodbye, people. Thank you for listening to the Kyle Reba podcast. And thank you for taking the time to listen to another amazing person that is doing amazing things that is just like you and I and like you is capable of greatness. 
So make sure that you listen to this, take away something from it and use that to inspire you to back yourself and become something that you could have never dreamed you're possible of becoming. Please make sure you listen to future episodes. Please make sure you follow, like and share all our channels because let's get the word out that everybody, everywhere, no matter who they are, is capable of doing some pretty amazing things. Thank you again for listening and we'll see you on the next one. My name's Kyle Reba. See you soon.